Alrighty, time for our next uh, speaker. And this is going to be Christian. And uh, you might know Christian from his, sorry? Yes. And you might know uh, Christian from his uh, work that he has done on uh, Valnix and on the vulner vulnerability, vulnerability, I can't even pronounce it, he did it, uh, vulnerability uh, roundups for NixOS. Um, but today he is going to talk to us about uh, this annoying situation in which you might end up where you're not actually yet running NixOS, but of course you want to. Uh, and he is uh, going to explain uh, us how to get out of the misery. Uh, quick applause, of course, please. Thanks. Yeah, hi everyone. So, um, does it work? Mm. Oh, sorry. Mm. No, okay, forget about it. So, uh, okay, as already, oh, it's the, what's going on here? to be working. Uh, sorry for the delay. Okay, uh, sorry about that. So, okay, as I already said, uh, hi, my name is Christian. I'm systems engineer doing this for a bit more than 10 years. You can at least see it with the laser pointer. Yeah, reach me by mail or find me at various social media or RAC or GitHub. Um, and I'm wanting to talk about migrating a hosting infrastructure from Gentoo to NixOS and answer at mostly two questions. Uh, first, what motivated us to migrate so you don't do that just out of a mood? And what experience did we make? So I'd like to share a bit of um, well, real, real world insights so um, perhaps the community can profit from that. So uh, when I say we, I mean Flying Circus Internet Operations. We are the guys with the cool aircraft. But a bit more than that, we are a small company located in Halle, Saale, in Germany. Um, and um, basically, we are taking care of customer applications. Um, so uh, there are customers uh, which can't or won't concentrate on operational issues uh, because, for example, they are software shops or they're too small or whatever. And so they approach us for deployment concepts, for automation, for telemetry, for monitoring, for incident response, for load and resource management, for upgrade strategies and much more. So uh, some <laughs> someone said uh, we are sort of DevOps for hire or DevOps as a service. Um, so we are actually uh, working closely together with the um, devs, um, usually on individual applications uh, and um, 
we um, work together to uh, keep the stuff running. So actually for customer projects we have um, more than 500 VMs with a lot of very diverse stuff installed and running on them. So, well, why did we migrate? So, uh, where w did we come from? We have been historically a uh, Gento and Puppet shop, and uh, well, bef before I'm gonna ditch this, it's important to state it went running for quite a while, and well, it was not too bad. So, uh, during the time we started that, Gentoo was a good choice because of its extreme configurability. And Puppet was also a good choice because at that time, I think it was one of the best tools you could get for automated systems management. Um, but, well, um, after doing that for 10 years or so, it got too complex. So um, Puppet is not able to manage everything, and so it was no problem. We are software engineers after all, so we say, well, let's write a script, let's write a wrapper, let's write a fix up. And this is a partial view of our old uh, system management stack. We see a lot of diverse steps and fixes and scripts and additional config runs and spe specific scripts for stuff, and this is only one-tenth of the whole thing. And uh, what you see is that uh, there are partly overlapping functionalities. Um, so, for example, Puppet can manage 80% of something, or Gentoo Emerge uh, can do 90% of something, but then we have to put another fix and another script. And, um, well, uh, it was painfully slow, so for a full uh, configuration run uh, we took more than five minutes on a typical VM. Too many moving parts, um, so you perhaps have to uh, emerge a package, but then you have to run RevDev Rebuild, don't know if anyone knows Gentoo, and then you have a Python updater, and then you have a Perl cleaner, and so on and so on. It and uh, which every step you add, you may get a bit closer to where you want, but not not really to the point. And this small gap, when you multiply that with 500 machines, gets a real awful lot of work still to be solved manually, and we didn't want to do that. So, well, uh, what, uh, what was the problem? What is more like we did a bad job? So would uh, we just have to improve the implementation? Or perhaps if is the approach not optimal? Is our whole model of system management too weak? Perhaps yes, and to answer this question, we have to go a bit into theory. So um, perhaps some of you may know the real great paper by Steve Trogott from NASA um, about why order matters. And in this paper, he defines three main models of system management. Um, the divergent system management, the convergent system management, and congruent system management. And I go to the each of these in detail. So what does divergence mean? Uh, I cite from the paper, divergence is characterized by the configuration of live hosts drifting away from any desired or assumed baseline disk content. So what is this? For example, this is when you configure a server by following a checklist. Let three admins do that, you get three different results. But also like installer scripts, for example, while well, call to shell. Mm. Um, okay, this is divergent system management, but there's also a legitimate use for divergence. For example, when you have user home DS or you have some sort of database content or any relevant productive data is by definition divergent. So if you wouldn't have that, then you could burn your entire data center on DVDs and then it's static, so no point about that. Um, the second model is the convergent model, so this is uh, where most of the system management tools we have today live in. So you have some description of the desired state, and then you measure the actual state, and then, uh, then you see where the delta is, and then you, for 
each deviation, you have a corrective action, which puts the actual system state uh, nearer to the desired system state. So uh, many uh, uh, things like Puppet or Ansible, Salt, and you name it, work this way. And this has also its use case and won't get away. For example, you have activation scripts in NixOS who are uh, constructed exactly around this model. Or for example, you have systemd services uh, which follow this model. Or uh, when you viewed as a larger scope, you see, for example, a container orchestration which also follows this model. So this model is good, but we can even get to a stronger model, the congruent model. This means congruence is the practice of maintaining this state in complete compliance with a fully descript descriptive baseline. So, for example, system packages are exactly defined um, in every distribution, and of course, everything in the Nix store is e exactly defined. Uh, but also there are, for example, container images which are exactly defined and, okay, you could argue if serverless functions uh, uh, belong to that as well or not. Perhaps yes. <laughs> so, and, well, um, to get maximum control, you want to make the congruent domain as large as possible and the other two doma uh, domains uh, while well still there but uh, just not growing too big. So we decided, uh, decided it's time to switch to another model. We wanted to follow the congruent approach and the two interesting candidates for doing so were of course NixOS and uh, of course going with a container thing. So, uh, well, um, everyone is going with a container thing today. Um, but, uh, well, um, they don't do well in a multi-tenant environment because they provide no great I isolation. And the other thing is that uh, container uh, technology, oh, well, has its strengths, but also has its weaknesses. And if you read some larger Docker file, then you know what I'm talking about. So what attracted us to NixOS? I think in the first place, uh, the Nix language is so expressive that you can do nearly everything with it. And this was, of course, very important for us as, as uh, software developers. You get a lot of flexibility. You can just mix everything together and uh, the, all the dependencies are still in place and working. Binary substitution, you get that basically for free un uh, when you manage to uh, get Hydra running. Um, and uh, well, someone said Nix is a tool to rule them all. So you have uh, one approach to packaging, to systems management, to deployment. And least but not last, uh, the community is very approachable. It was no problem for us to get into the community and for example, place a pull request or something like that. This is very great. Okay, wha what did we do? So, okay, I'm just talking to uh, some hackers here. So uh, the hacker would think uh, no problem at all, just install NixOS on the VMs and everyone will be happy. So, uh, well, every one of you would just start to put your whole project in one big default.nix and that would describe everything, then you would just say Nix build and then the whole project just builds and everything is fine. Um, well, this is what Nix OS hackers think, um, but we had a large installed base which was not constructed with Nix OS in mind and we had to put that somehow over the fence and uh, we'll see what's there, how can we get that running and while doing so, we talked to our customers, we reviewed the code, and we found out, well, not everyone is ready for NixOS. Uh, well, NixOS is sort of a, well, don't understand me wrong, but it's a hacker thing. It's technically very advanced. So I like that very much, but uh, some of our users were frightened. So they had quite a bit of, 
a hard time with uh, this congruent or immutable approach. So for example, hey, I want just to edit some etc whatever file, why can I do that? And uh, where is the option for x and z? And do you have a GUI? And what's going on here? Don't understand that. And slash user bin is empty, so where is all of the stuff gone? And oh, I'm almost overwhelmed. Okay, nix, nix, what's that? from funny language, so I don't understand. So can can I program that like shell? No, I can't, and I don't understand that. So functional programming is very ex expressive. Once you get into it, it's really fun, and you don't want to go back and do something <laughs> other. But if you don't know, do that, and for example, you're more like an admin guy who started putting some CDs into some Microsoft Windows uh, boxes, uh, then it's quite a steep learning curve. That was for the one thing. And the other thing, well, it depends on what you're running. And uh, we do a, a, la a lot of uh, web applications. And they are, um, well, uh, some of them uh, insist of trying to build themselves in the very moment you are starting them up. For example, we've got some Node.js application which uh, just starts to compile some C code in the moment you're trying to start that. Um, or we have some CMS applications who uh, start to optimize themselves somehow. I don't know what they're doing, but they, I do, uh, do know for sure they're going to fail if they cannot write their installation directory. Um, and we also have some uh, applications which are um, centered around this uh, model of um, incremental, build, incremental build. So for example, uh, some stuff which uh, needs an installed base and then needs uh, to reinstall itself depending on the old installed base. And if you try to install everything from scratch, then it takes one and a half hours or so. Also some plugin system, auto op auto update systems and so on. So while well, you could say um, that's all bad, rule it out. Yeah, but we are <laughs> earning our money uh, with running business critical customer applications and most of them have some tiny ugly core deep within uh, which well isn't really good software design but is absolutely important and uh, everyone knows okay no it's not the best um, but we cannot do without it and uh, it's our job to keep it running so how to solve that obviously we cannot um, rewrite everything and nixify everything right away so we decided for a flexible approach so we um, just um, took uh, the application in the uh, narrower sense, so, so the custom code, and uh, see if that f uh, matches more a uh, convergent model or another model. And we also separate components. Uh, we also had that in our old Gentoo setup, which bundle uh, often mostly used uh, things like Nginx, like Postgres, like Redis, like Memcached, like Elasticsearch that many projects use. Um, and now we see which part of what goes into what model. So the application deployment depends largely on the project. We have some conventional deployment, for example, like Ansible. We didn't want to uh, get uh, other tools at that point. We have even divergent stuff like data deals. Um, but there are also congruent uh, elements, for example, like uh, customer supplied container images. And of course, there are a few already Nixified projects. Um, the color code is green is congruent, uh, yellow is convergent, and red is divergent. Um, as it comes to uh, the uh, pre-made components, um, most of them uh, have some glue code, uh, use some Nix service modules, which are in place already, and uh, have uh, some integration points. Uh, what does that mean? These are directories or files where user deployments can typically put some snippets in. The, so this is the equivalent of uh, fiddling with some config files under etc. So, um, I give an example. For 
example, our Nginx component has an integration point. This is some directory, and uh, you can just drop in some virtual hosting configuration files and so on. And that stuff gets picked up by the NixOS rebuild run using our glue code and gets incorporated in the configuration running in the uh, Nix store so w that we still run everything out of the Nix store, but uh, users find at least some points uh, they can cope with. So that was the plan, Was what was our experience? For most projects, with all of this in place, it was quite doable. Um, While well you have to fiddle around a, lit a little bit, but uh, m I think 90% of our customer projects went quite fine with that. Um, we, of course, have some dependencies which used to come out, this out of the system installation under Gentoo, for example, some libraries like uh, uh, SSL and so on. And most of them um, are now placed into the user Nix profile um, during whatever, uh, using whatever mechanism uh, is fitting. So uh, it's in some project we install them via NixEnv and others have a default Nix which builds an Env which is going to be installed there. And in the end we see a large running code base mixing up Nix code from as far back from 1509 until the current stuff. And uh, due to Nix OS, we are able to mix it. So it works out, so this is really great. So, of course, we made some tools to facilitate this. Um, our major wrapper, and it's only one wrapper for everything, uh, is FC Manage. This is basically a thin layer above NixOS rebuilds and uh, that runs regularly from a system D a timer and pulls the channel, sees if uh, every changes occur and triggers them. And then what's uh, perhaps more interesting for the community, it's a little tool called FC User Scan that scans unmanaged installations. For example, a user just compiles code in his home and uh, that uh, uses some libraries from the Nix store, but the Nix store garbage collector doesn't know about that and deletes the libraries at some point and then the user code doesn't run anymore. And so uh, the scanner just goes through the uh, installation and registers all link time dependencies it finds with a, a Nix star garbage collector. And of course, Vulnix, I think this is well known, this scans an installation for open CVEs. So, what were the main benefits from our point of view? Uh, going from Gen2 to, to Nix gave us significantly higher productivity, so we can do stuff in no time, which took days uh, in the old environment. Uh, we also have uh, tests on the infrastructure level, this is quite good. Uh, we got a lot more flexibility because we don't have to say, okay, this particular version of OpenSSL is the system version and uh, you have to use that and nothing else. Um, and also we see that we can uh, scale things. So for example, uh, most engine X based configs are the same, but also have the flexibility to um, um, bring in customer specific modifications uh, without losing oversight. So what do our users think? Uh, well, <laughs> most users don't care. So they just want to have some Linux server. So uh, while well, distro, uh, don't know, so okay, get it running, that's fine. So um, we would like to have some more projects where uh, customers are just shipping a default Nix and say, hey, that's my default Nix, uh, run that in production, but it's only the case for maximum 10% of our projects. Um, so I think we, um, we profit more um, of the migration than our users profit directly, but of course they uh, profit 
indirectly because uh, we are better off right now. Okay, to finish on, um, there are some things which, um, well, I would wanted to call the section pain points, but I think that's a misnomer because working with Nix is, is not painful at all, it's fun, so I call it things to improve. Um, the security story, so uh, I've been busy uh, uh, providing vulnerability roundups uh, every one week or two, um, but when you look uh, around, uh, you see uh, quite a long list of open issues. So I think um, we need a better approach to actually fixing stuff. Um, so discovering of what needs to be done is good, but it's only first step. The second step is to fix the stuff. And in my opinion, this is largely a problem of missing manpower. So I would really happy to see a larger security team and I want to use Saturday, I don't know, uh, for people who are still around there, um, just to, to see what could be done uh, in the short term, uh, just to get uh, this one better. And we also should uh, think about uh, backporting important changes to older releases. Don't know if we need a formal process for that or just uh, start by doing so informally. The other point that uh, is a constant source of well, uh, confusion with our customers is that uh, Nixos uh, likes to restart everything, uh, even for minor changes. Uh, well, it, it comes from the model. If I change any input, the hash changes, the unit file changes, and systemd restarts the unit. So uh, when you see, for example, here for Postgres, it's uh, well quite a problem because uh, it terminates all connections restarts and then uh, the application just has to reconnect and we've got one minute of useless downtime. So also here the question if is can we do better, can we come up with some clever scheme to avoid that without breaking the overall NixOS model. And well, uh, the last point is um, I think the community has grown quite a bit over the last years. Um, NixOS is um, attracting a larger user base. This is great news, but I think we have to keep up with the community structure. So um, from my perspective, I would really be glad to see more teams with uh, well, uh, clearly structures, uh, structured re responsibilities. Well, perhaps there already exist some teams, but then they are not well discoverable, <laughs> at least. So I think this is a point where we can and should improve, and uh, so uh, just to continue the success of NixOS. So as a final question, if we would be in the same situation we've been three years ago, right? Now, would we choose NixOS again? Probably yes. I think it's a really great piece of software infrastructure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, hello, hi, thanks. Um, so one of your slides was very interesting. That just what the first one of the first ones is NixOS versus containers, and uh, every, well, someone would have to ask that. Um, yeah, yeah. So with Docker and containers, there is this huge pool um, about one containers runs one application and so on. So it, it seems that it fits quite well at my understanding what you are doing because your customers have one application and they want to run one application in a container. So would you like to elaborate a bit about why NixOS for you was a bad choice? Please? Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, well, um, one point is that containers are only part of the solution because in a multi-tenant environment you 
have to uh, provide encaps encapsulation anyway, and uh, so we still need some management for the underly uh, underlying thing, be it VMs, whatever, um, and we're not uh, large enough to have dedicated hardware per customer. Um, and the other thing is that um, containers impose a, a specific way of deploying the application because you have to follow their standard or you aren't going to use it well. And uh, with our customer base, this is not possible. For example, we have a, we are a historical Python shop and there are a lot of CC build out um, based projects and uh, they don't work uh, together very well. In ad addition to that, we uh, are experimenting now with running containers inside VMs just to uh, give the benefits of both worlds. More questions? Yes. What was the first question? Yes. Um, <laughs> so your 10% of your base, uh, of user base, is already using default Nix, so kind of they Nixify the project for you, yeah. in a sense. Um, At least partly. Yeah, uh, what is the difference in maintainability or uh, between this 10% and uh, let's say some, some similar size project? Okay, it largely depends on the project. Um, in my experience, the maintainability uh, is more um, uh, dependent on the software code base as such. So there are, for example, uh, projects uh, which uh, uh, save parts of the code in their databases and uh, well, that's a nightmare. Um, and uh, while well we have quite uh, good uh, convergent uh, deployment tools, for example, we uh, use Bateau, this is an in-house tool, uh, or Ansible and other tools, and if you do that well, it works too. Um, so um, I think the major benefit of projects uh, which are using uh, Nixified setup is that you've got the exact reproducibility on the developers' computers. So you know, okay, exactly what is running here will be running there. Uh, I think this is the same promise that containers make. Um, and I think this is the main benefit. Um, for um, the most other projects, we have a much more uh, sort of staging setup with a lot of VMs that are solely there to, uh, to see that everything still fits together in the deployment. Th we have that too for Nixified projects, but uh, they don't need that much for uh, staging. Um, second question. Okay. Um, so you remember, do you still remember when you came back uh, to your meeting with the idea Let's try Nix and see it. And when your coworkers, yeah. okay, that was actually Domen, the guy. So um, we had a sprint at uh, uh, then Gosep. This was the former company, and um, we were supposed on hacking on some Python stuff. And I know very well Domen just put there some Nix stuff in and. Uh, just said here, look at that, that's cool, and we all looked at that and said, ah, that's weird. <laughs> but, um, well, well, you have to free yourself uh, from uh, 30 years of uh, thinking that's the way how Unix or Linux is. Um, uh, and uh, well, after seeing that presentation, um, we've been thinking about that for nearly a year or so, and then starting to try it. Maybe time for one last question that doesn't have sub-questions. <laughs> 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 yes. Can you pass it on, please? Hello. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I want to uh, ask you about uh, the emerge keywords in Gen2 compared to the module system that Alco showed. Like, how do you compare them? Um, I think uh, there's nothing to compare, really, because uh, the whole eMERGE ecosystem is solely about installing packages and uh, not really about uh, doing service configuration. So um, the whole NixOS module systems uh, uh, is uh, one abstraction layer up. 
So did that answer your question? Not really, okay. And perhaps have a personal talk. Ah. Yeah. Already, uh, yeah, you, you, can, you can find him uh, afterwards uh, during what comes up next, which is uh, the next coffee break. Uh, so a small round of applause again, please, for Christian and his great talk. Thank you. Thank you, Christian.